Okay. 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 Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, so we're going to talk about discrete events um, and how they can be useful in uh, modeling and simulation. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do this with Jon Morar, although I think I have more slides than Jon, so I'll try to get on through them quickly. This is both um, applicable to Copasi and VCL, as you will see in a moment. So what are discrete events? Uh, discrete events are actions that happen at a specific certain instant in time and that may change the model or may not, as we will see in a moment. But they, the, the key point here is that they happen at a certain instant, instantaneously. Um, and then, um, so at that moment, your models that were based on ODEs that were continuous become discrete. And there is going to be some discontinuity in, in various cases. Uh, events were defined in the SVML uh, standard, and therefore they're both available in Copasi and VCell. We follow, I, I believe, the <laughs> specifications for events are uh, pretty um, straightforward in the two applications. So the main features for events are when they happen, what variables or parameters they modify, and finally, there you may add an optional delay for applying the action. So an event may happen at a certain time, get triggered, and the action happens a certain time later. Uh, I'm actually not going to um, discuss the delays much. Um, we can talk about it at the end if needed, but uh, I'm going to actually not talk much about delays. I don't think they're very much used, actually. So in Copasi, this is how you would define an event. An event has a name, it's just an identifier. It has a, a section that says when to apply the event. We will talk about this uh, exactly later on. Then um, what is the, the items that are changed? In this case, it's just one item in your model. And then the new value that it should have. And in this particular case, um, this event just says that at time 500, we set the map kinase PP concentration to 200. We're going to later on going to talk about exactly how you interpret go from that to this. Um, then in virtual cell, you can do the same thing. So this is actually the exactly same event for the same model in virtual cell. Uh, it so happens there is in the protocols um, of the application. So you have to have an application and in the protocols you have events. So this is the same thing. The event name is here, when to apply it, what is changed and the new value. Now, when you do the simulation, this is in this particular event, the one that I just showed as an example here, this is what happens. This is the time 500 that I mentioned, and the event happens exactly here. So you see a discontinuity in the dynamics, uh, but then after the event, it continue, uh, the ODs continue from that point. So let's go a little bit more in detail on each of these uh, issues. So the first thing to define is when an event happens. And that is uh, done in uh, following the definition in SBML. An event is triggered, uh, that's the concept we, we, we use, it's triggered by a logical expression. So it's an expression that has basically a value of true or false. Um, and the event happens when that expression changes value from false to true. Um, that is very, it's a key part to understand. It happens when it changes from false to true but not when it changes from true to false. It's only when the expression changes from false to true. So for example, uh, some examples of triggers, we have this one, time larger than 400. So when your simulation starts, time is equal to zero. So that's actually false, right? Zero is not larger than 400. And it continues being false until time exactly matches 400. And then an infinitesimal amount later, which in floating point means it's exactly at 400, that expression goes from false to true. And at 400.0001, it was true and it continues to be true. So it's only triggered exactly at this time 400. Then at 401, 402, etc. Any time after this, the expression is just staying true and that doesn't trigger anything. It's only at the moment when it goes from false to true. So time is uh, the most logical thing to do, but you can also define logical expressions that don't include time. For example, you may have concentration of A larger than concentration of B. And so if in a simulation at some moment concentration of A is smaller than B, and then it becomes larger than B, the moment when it becomes larger than B, 
it's exactly when the um, event happens. You can have even events that, uh, even though you just define one event, it may happen many times in the simulation. For example, if you define a differential equation that has a sinusoid, in this case, I uh, the example is sine of time times pi divided by five. This, as you will see, has a trough every ten um, every ten seconds, every ten units of time, and your your trigger is that the rate of that sinusoid, so this right-hand side here, is larger than zero. Uh, so then that gets triggered every 10 um, um, units of time. So this is what happens. That sinusoid starts here at zero, and it's uh, the rate is larger than zero. So actually starts as true. But remember, it didn't change from false to true. It was true already. So there's not, no event happening here. And then at this moment, it becomes false because now the rate is lower, right? It's it's coming down. And then at the, at the bottom, right there where the arrow says, it's when it goes from false to true. So that's when the event happens. And it happens again at 20, and it happens again at 30 and 40, etc. So you could see already you could use something like this to have repeated events if you want. You'll just have to change a little bit the parameters here to have a different different times. So that's the when that is uh, triggering the event. So now let's look at what is changed, the targets, the, the things that can change in the model. So an event can have one or several targets. It is not limited to one. We will see some examples where there's many targets. And these targets are either parameters or variables of the model. So they could be, for example, in Copasi mode, they could be concentrations of species. They could be global quantities. They could be kinetic. Um, rates, uh, rate constants, etc. And if you change parameters, that means that your model changes, right? So you, if you change a rate constant, that means that your model became um, um, different at that moment. If you change a variable, then you're just changing the state of the model. The model itself is the same, but the um, uh, state of the model changed. And then you will see that we can also have quantities that don't affect the model they basically are created just to store values that you want to remember. So I, I like to call those probes. They like they, fun, they function just like probes in an experiment. So how do you define a new value? The new value for the targets is defined with an algebraic expression. So that's a function that has a numeric value. And that could be just a number, like I had before, 200. Or it could be an expression, uh, some function that contains other values. The only thing to remember here is that the values used in that expression are the, the values that existed before the trigger happened, not after the event, just at the moment the trigger happened. Even if those entities also are changed by the event, the value that they use is always the value that they had just before the event happened. That is uh, also a key thing. You will see sometimes people get confused by this, but you'll see an example. So now I'm going to show some examples so that we can see what can be done. So the most simple thing is, as I mentioned, which was my, my very beginning of this, is at a certain point in time, we want to do a perturbation in the model. And so this is like a time-dependent perturbation. For example, I want to add an aliquot of an inhibitor at a certain point in time. So change the concentration of an inhibitor or change the rate of entry of a substrate. In this case, it would be a change in the uh, perturbation of the model itself. Um, so I have an example here that I'm going to show you in Kupazi. Um, that is a model that I showed, that I actually published in a paper a long time ago. It's a simple um, signaling cascade. You have uh, first kinase that has an inactive form and an active form. You have a second kinase that has an inactive and an active form. And that last is an enzyme itself that has an inactive form and an active form. When it's active, it catalyzes this reaction of a metabolic pathway. So when you have, when you apply the signal, the signal activates the, um, trans the transformation into active and inhibits the transformation into inactive. So when you add signal, you will have more active enzyme and you will have higher flux of this reaction. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create an event that at a certain moment in time will change the value of signal. So in this model, we start with, um, so your signal initial concentration is actually zero. So we have no signal at all in the beginning. And we created an event that says at time 20, so time larger than 20, which means it's false before 20 and it's, it's true after 20, 
we change the value of signal and we have it to take the value of one. So in this case, we are just setting this algebraic expression is just the number one. So if I run this simulation now, you will see that that's exactly what happens. So when I run this time course, and let me first show you the concentrations, um, and the first kinase, the inactive form exactly at time 20, as you see, went from some value to a lower value. And the active form of that went from one value to a, another value. In fact, they went from minimum to maximum right away. Then the second kind is a little bit later changes because the first one did change. So it also, the inactive form goes down and the active form goes down. And finally, the enzyme also changes. It's further down the chain. So you see, it's a little bit later that it, the change happens than the others. And that's because of the kinetics of the model. And finally, uh, your intermediate also changes. So if you look at the fluxes of the reactions, and in this case, I just want to look at the flux towards P1, that flux was low or zero, and at a certain moment, it increases. And of course, it caused because there is a competition for M, the flux to P2 consequently also decreased. So this is an, a simple example where you just decided at a certain time, you make a change. Um, then in some cases, the events can also be part of the model. So what I'm going to show in, in this one, it's a, this is actually a famous model from Chen et al, from the Tyson and Novak groups, where they have a model of uh, yeast cell cycle. This is in biomodels, it's number 56. I'm actually going to, I have the file already, so I'm going to um, just load it uh, in Copasi, import it. It's here, SPML. And this is a rather complicated model, it has 94 reactions, 54 species, uh, 164 global quantities, but it has four events. And I'm showing in Copasi here the events. And what are the events? The events are the checkpoints that exist in the cell cycle and the cell division itself. So let's look at the cell division event. That event is triggered by uh, one particular protein, CLIP2, being becoming smaller than a certain value. KZ is actually a constant. If we look in the global quantities, and it so happens that KZ has the value 0 0.3. So the expression there says, that particle minus KEZ smaller than zero. So that's the same as saying that particle, that clip two smaller than KEZ. And at that moment, four things get changed. One of them is the mass. So they do multiply the mass by a factor F, which is a number smaller than one. So the mass will decrease. LTE is set to a constant. LTEL is also a, a parameter that is defined here. And it's an actual parameter and it has a value 0.1 and the other thing is that um, bud and spin these two variables get set to zero. So let's just very quickly look at what happens in this model. So you can see the trigger now happens because there's no time involved here. So this will happen whenever this expression goes from false to true. So looking at the time course, I know that we have to run about a thousand units of time and let's have some uh, points. I'm going to just create a plot of all the concentrations. Now, when I run this, let's look at clip two, which is the trigger. This is what, what happens to clip two. It goes up and it comes down. And if you remember, it's 0.3 and it's lower than 0.3. So it has to happen here, but it should happen there again, and there again, and there again. So let's look at one of the targets, which was mass. What happens to mass? So you can see in this model, mass is increasing until it gets to the event, which happens exactly at this moment when it passes 0.3, and then mass gets divided by, uh, by uh, gets lowered by that factor. And then the same thing happens there and there and there and there and there and there and so on. So in this case, the event is actually part, intrinsic part of the model. It's um, something that happens every time. And this is one of the things that causes the cell division. So um, in this case, it's a model 
uh, that has an, ex uh, an intrinsic event. So an another um, example, it's which is similar to this, is find a time when a variable exceeds a threshold. So I'm going to, um, or another example, measure the period of an oscillation, or even better, measure the amplitude of an oscillation. So uh, I'm going to actually skip to this one to measure the period of an oscillation. In fact, I'll have an example that measures both the period and the amplitude of an oscillation. So I'm going to load this model. It's a model you've seen before. It's the map kinase model of Kolodenko. Again, um, it has a time course. And in the time course, if we run this, it also oscillates the model. You see the variables are oscillating, all of them. And what we do, and what we want to do, find out, is the period of this oscillation of map KK, map KPP, but also the amplitude. How high is this uh, movement? So we define, for that, we have to define a few things. We have to define some global quantities because we're going to need to store values for, for various things. So we need to find what is the last time of, a, of an oscillation because the period is this distance between one peak and the other. So when I hit one peak, I need to subtract from the current time the time of the previous peak. So I have to remember when is the time for the last peak, and that's going to be stored in this variable. I need to have another variable that stores the period because that's what I want to measure. I need to measure the amplitude. So for the amplitude, I need to find out when there is a minimum and a maximum, and I need to store the size of the minimum and the size of the maximum so that the amplitude can be the difference between the two. So how do I do this? I do this with two events. One event is to find a peak, and the other event is to find a trough. So a peak is this point, the highest point, and the trough is the lowest point. So let's look at what the peak does. So the peak is very simple, is we look at the rate of map KK, and that rate needs to become smaller than zero. And that happens, it's here, it's positive, it's larger than zero, and at this moment it becomes smaller than zero, because now it's decreasing, right? So I'm this event is going to detect all of the peaks. And what does that event do? Well, the first thing it does is that it, in the, it stores the current value of time in, in that parameter I called last time. This is going to be useful for the next, if, next event, not for this current one. But then it measures the period as being the current time minus the last time. Remember, this event happened just now last time still has the value that it had before the event. I set it here, but this is all arbitrary. This is, this, this is not the order in which these things happen. They happen simultaneously. And when I use last time, it's the same last time that I had before, not the one that I just set. So that's the period, is the current time and is the last time. I also need to find out store the value for the high. The high is the value that map kinase has in the peak. So I'm storing it here. And the amplitude that I measured in this peak is the value from the lowest, it's my current value, the, which is high, minus the last, the last low value that I measured. And we'll see in a moment how we measured the low. But that's what amplitude will be here at this peak. Then I go to the trough event. That happens exactly the opposite. You saw it here, the sign just changes. It's exactly the point where this becomes, goes from being negative to positive. And then at this trough, I only need to change two things. The first one is that I need to measure the amplitude. And the amplitude is the last high value, which is stored in the, in the events that have peaks. So it's the last high value minus the current because the current is at the, at the bottom. So it's that minus this. And I also now just need to store the value that we are at here as the last low so that in the next iteration, this value can be remembered and used for the peak amplitude. So that's it, that's uh, the events explained. So now let's just run this and show you what happens to the, um, to the amplitude and period that we are going to measure. So now I'm going to run the time course and I have two more windows. And now I have a window 
So this is still my my uh, simulation. As you can see, there was not no changes in the simulation. It happens just because these variables that I'm now storing, they don't affect the model. So the model is running perfectly well. So I just have these probes. So the period in the first oscillations, as you can see, changes. So the first one we have to ignore because it's just this little bottom here. And then the second one and the third is, this is a large peak. This is a large amplitude, sorry, large period. But then it stabilizes. As you can see, the period then stabilizes and it stays the same for all these oscillations. So this value is our stable um, period. And the amplitude, the same thing. There was here a bigger amplitude. You find the larger value. Then you have um, a little bit smaller and then it stabilizes. And then it's a, a constant amplitude. So you can check the values at the end if you look at the quantities and you see that the period is 1299.77. That's the exact value of the period. And then the amplitude is 260.82. So here you have two probes that just let you measure the period and the amplitude of oscillation. Now you could use the amplitude and the period in other things, for example, trying to fit the model to have a certain amplitude or trying to optimize it and say maximize the amplitude. Uh, you could you now use these two vari uh, parameters, variables in this case, to exploit in the rest of the model. So just the final example, which is a little bit more elaborate and I'm getting uh, to my end so that I can pass it on to Jon. And this is an example very similar to the one he's going to show as well. And this is um, um, comes from a paper from Tyson. This is um, uh, a bistable switch. It's a very simple model that has a signal. It has a response um, protein. Uh, and that response protein activates the phosphorylation of an enzyme and the phos activate the phosphorylated uh, enzyme produces even more response. So you have a two positive feedback loops here. So you get uh, what is called a bistable switch. So you have this bistability system. And we use that model as well. We have also a version of this model. It actually came from originally from biomodels although I have already made some changes, so let me just open it. And um, we have three events here. The first event adds signal, and it add, keeps adding signal, but it only adds signal and then it waits, it adds signal whenever the system has relaxed to a steady state. So it measures the changes in R, and when the changes in R are smaller than a certain value, it considers that to be a steady state and then adds more S and it adds always the same amount. So we keep adding S to the system. And at some point when we get S to be equal to one, we want to start decreasing S. So there's another event that changes the sign of the increment whenever S reaches one. And then finally, when we, we are now decreasing the value of S. We don't want S to become less than zero. So when it reaches zero or smaller than zero, we stop the perturbation. So we set increment to zero and we reset S to zero. Okay, so here are the three events. First one looks at the rate. And in fact, I'm looking at the absolute value of the rate. So it doesn't matter if it's going up or down, that absolute value needs to be less than 10 to the minus six. And that means my system is in what I consider a steady state for R. And in that case, I increase, whenever that happens, I increase S by this increment. S inc is a global quantity and it's fixed. I have set it to 0 0.05. So that's all that happens. When this event happens, my model increases S. So if I run a time course for about 300, you will see what happens. So if I show just S, S is increasing from 0 to 0 0.5, then to 0 0.1, then to 1.5, and etc. And that happens when R, when R stabilizes. So here it increased, R went up, and it's stabilizing. And, and finally, when it stabilizes, we apply again the increment, and then now we wait until this stabilizes, we add another increment and you go like this all the way up to one. So let me show a larger interval that already goes above one. So here you see 
you are increasing the signal, increasing the signal, increasing the signal, and the response is increasing little bits. Then at this moment, we increase a little increase in the signal, caused a large increase in the response. And this is where we have the discontinuity, the, the bifurcation, we jumped into the other branch. So now we keep continuing increasing signal, signal continue, the response continues going up, and until we reach one. And now once we reach one for the signal, we're going to start decreasing the signal and the response is also coming down. So let's go and look at this all the way. And this is what happens in the model when we go all the way to 4000 is that now we increase the signal, then the signal starts decreasing, right? The signal starts decreasing until it hits zero. That's my third um, event. When it reaches zero, event number three says, oh, if that's, if that's just became smaller than zero, I make the, inc the increment become zero and I also make S become zero. So S is going to stay zero no longer will change because we will add zero to it. So that's what happened here. The signal went back to zero, which was where it was in the beginning. But you can see your, your response never went back to zero. And this is exactly what this model does. It, it has hysteresis. So once you go above a certain limit, when you come back, you no longer go to the original um, state. So this system has some memory. At this moment, it remembers that it has hit it has gone over this threshold before, and so it stays over at this value. It doesn't come down from there. So I'm going to end this part. I'm going to pass to Jon. And um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Jon move on. Thank you, Pedro. <clears throat> uh, everybody, uh, I think your head is spinning at this point. Uh, uh, Pedro really went fast uh, over a lot of different uh, concepts here. Um, I'll try to relax a little bit and go a little bit slower with uh, showing examples of the same uh, concepts using B-cell and um, showing some of the software-specific um, quirks that um, how you would implement the events and uh, the same things in these cells. So let me get started here by sharing. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so here's B cell going up. So you know the basics of events and the different types of using of these events. So um, I will do most of my presentation Yeah, and we just lost your voice. It's bandwidth again. Simple model where Jan, we had lost I you for it. a few. We lost you for a few, uh, for maybe thirty seconds. So you might want to go back a little bit. Oh, we lost your. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, just uh, starting with a live demo about a very simple model where I'm going to exercise the same types of events that. Pedro mentioned in Capaci, and this will be in B cell. So, this is the most basic reaction in V cell where one species gets transformed in another one by a, a 
simple mass action kinetics. Let's put in some values of a uh, forward reaction rate and a reverse reaction rate and um, we will create a new application where we can simulate this for let's say 10 seconds and we'll have an initial condition where everything is and do this like this um so if we run this simple reaction you will see that the species S0 equilibrated with species S1, given the forward and reaction, forward and backward reaction rates that I put in some arbitrary numbers there, right? Now, one thing that may have been shown in the various presentations before, but maybe not, and in case not, it, it's something that's useful. You can create um, various functions, quote unquote observables, that are um, arbitrary expressions of the variables in your models. This is not related to events, but it's something that's very useful anyway. So I wanted to show this. Uh, so in this case, let's say S total would be S zero plus S one. So if you define an observable like this, you will see that it is available to be plotted And as expected, the total amount of the two species that just equilibrate between themselves is constant. And we initialize the system with one species at seven micromolar, the other one at zero. They have a mass action conversion reaction. They equilibrate quickly, but the total amount remains constant. Okay. So one of the application of events that Pedro has mentioned is to inject uh, an amount during the simulation. So how would we do that? In vCell, in the application, you would have protocols where you have a tab that's called events, and we can create a new event, say, at a sync, at two seconds is when it happens. So you have the trigger that determines when the event happens. In this case, it's a very simple trigger, a fixed time point. And then you would add the action, what do you want? So let's say S0 at this point, we want to modify it and say it's going to be as zero plus five. So we are injecting five more micromolar of the species. And if we rerun the simulation now, what we see is that S0 that equilibrated in, with S1 up to 9.2 seconds. Now it will go up by five more micromolar and re equilibrate. So this is the effect of the event where we forcefully change the concentration of one variable at a given time. 
but you can also change parameter values, not only specious concentrations. However, there is a little quirk related to parameter values. Let's assume that in this reaction, you would like to change the concentration, the, the um, affinity of the conversion between S0 and S1, and say that the KR changes to 20. However, if you look at the event, Let's say we want to create another event that at time point five, we're going to change the parameter value of that reaction. And if you look at the value, you don't see those parameters. The reason you don't see those parameters is that you can change in these cell only variables or global parameters. So in case you haven't yet used global parameters, this is a good time to show you what global parameters mean. So we'll go back to the reaction and let's say this is actually all my parameters something. You can always do expressions of expressions and all this. And this will give you the exact same reaction, just that the AR is the symbolic value that we named in my parameter and the same value as before. However, if you define, if you have a user-defined parameter, you can call this a global parameter which makes it available to be seen in global parameters here and is available throughout the entire model, not only inside the reaction. So in, in, a, in a mass action reaction with predefined parameters of forward rate and reverse rate, those are local to the actual reaction. However, a global parameter can be reused in other reactions and you can have coordinated changes throughout the model in multiple reactions. So now going back to the protocols and the event, if we want to add an action here, you will see that alongside the two species, concentrations that you can alter by a quote unquote injection or subtraction of a particular value in your model, you can also alter any of the global parameters in the model. So let's say this one, we want to modify it and actually change it to a value of 20. So if we now we run the simulation. What you will see is that we had the first event that triggered at two seconds where we injected more of a zero. So let's plot both values. And they calibrated again and now we don't change anything in the total amount. We just change the affinity of the conversion between S0 and S1 by changing this parameter. So the new equilibration is at this value. So all the classes that Pedro had mentioned of using events to change parameter values, change values of different um, species concentrations or of observables where um, you can, you know, the probes, quote unquote, that Pedro mentioned, you can use those, but the only restriction is that 
you have to have probes or parameters as global parameters in B-cell in order to do that. It's actually the same thing in Copasi as well. Uh, you have to have them as globals in Copasi? Yes. 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 Okay. So, cool. So that, that, that's consistent. Um, now, I will move to uh, a more complex example, which is very, very similar to the one that um, uh, Pedro mentioned with um, the um, uh, example of uh, uh, the model from the Tyson paper. And if, okay, so. This paper from 2003 is actually um, very useful reading for anybody who is interested in modeling. Um, it has a sort of catchy title about sniffers, buzzer toggles. It makes all sorts of different analogies between, you know, uh, real physical devices that we use in in in, uh, in the real world. Um, and the dynamic behavior of certain model, uh, certain model components. And one thing that this paper does is in figure one, uh, this may be too small to see, let me try to, is it picks up on electrical engineering standards of doing signal to re or communications or whatever signal to response curves of devices so it will plot the rate of change of the variable of interest called r quote unquote the response as a function of the input, which is the signal. And you can see the linear response. <clears throat> you can see phosphorylation, this phosphorylation is a hyperbolic response, sigmoidal response, perfect adaptation, mutual activation, mutual inhibition. So the model that Pedro has shown is this. Uh, figure 1E, which creates a bistable switch that has under certain signal values, three different equilibrium values. Two of them are stable and one is unstable. The one that I will show is in 1F, which is a mutual inhibition. One that has the exact same, that a very similar behavior with two different stable and one unstable uh, equilibrium point. And in order to explore that, I will use events in order to increase the signal slowly to reach the upper level and then decrease to reach the lower level. So this particular um, model, we find it it's it's really useful to understand both bifurcation diagrams and hysteresis, and it is actually a model that Michael and I are using in our um, introductory course for graduate students in systems biology as a home assignment where uh, a bistable switch, according to that paper, has to be implemented in either capacity or V-cell by students and we give them the right parameter values in order to observe the desired behavior. So I will actually show you one of these um, models implemented by one of our students this fall. Uh, which 
you already know by now that you have the sharing in the database and hopefully I will. I have too many things shared. So in the sharing, you can actually search for models for a particular time range. So I will only search models shared with me for the last year. And now we have a more reasonable number of models. Let's see. This one. Okay. So this is the reaction diagram that corresponds to that cartoon from figure 1F uh, in the Tyson paper where a signal is uh, stimulating the production of a molecule which then simulates the conversion between a phosphorylated and dephosphorylated state of another enzyme and it has a mutual inhibition circle coming back. So here are two applications where the first assignment was to create a uh, parameter scan to use different values of the stimulus and see at what level the steady state is being achieved. And if we look at the results, you will see the stimulus when stimulus is zero, everything is zero, obviously, but we can plot this. Oops. Okay. For a different. We can look at them individually for different values, but you can choose to plot them all in the parameter scan. And now you will see that there's the equilibration of the system for different values of S that are initially increased slowly with the value of S and then suddenly go to a much higher value, which is this toggle switch behavior. Now, in order to explore this more carefully, we can, instead of simply setting the value on the different simulations for different values of S, we can do the same thing that Pedro did, which is create an event that will increase the value of S um, in increments over time and let the system equilibrate. So how did the student implement that? It's in this other application called trigger. So if we look at protocols, try to make this a little bit more reasonable here. Sorry about that. So under events, there are two events here. It's not as, as fancy as Pedro did where it automatically detects when it reaches a plateau and comes back down. The student implemented two separate events, which says 57 times from zero to 8,000 seconds, it will increment the stimulus by 005. So one thing that you can look at the trigger is any expression you can say plot the trigger. And so you can verify that you're obtaining what you want. And in this case, it just ends 
So as you can see, for the 8,000 seconds that the student chose to increase the value, it triggers 57 times and it shows you the value from zero, false, to one, true. So every time the trigger changes from zero to one, it actually triggers the event. So, and then the second one is after 8,000 seconds, for the next 8,000 seconds, the stimulus is decremented by 005. And if we look at the results of that simulation, um, I need to run it. There's no saved results in the database. So it will now run it for 16,000 seconds. So it will take a few more seconds. Um, Jan, we're running pretty much over time, so if you can... I, I know, I know. Uh, this this will be the end of it. Okay. There we go. Almost there. So... Initially, S0 increases slowly. Well, the EP value increases slowly and then goes up abruptly. And if we look at the actual R value, this is the plot similar to the one Pedro has shown. That the actual response molecule will equilibrate slowly up to a point when there's a sudden switch to a different type of equilibrium. Now, one thing that you can do in B-cell is to not plot against time. You can plot one variable against the other. So if you plot R against S, you will see the bifurcation diagram as for certain values of the stimulus between zero and about 0 0.8 is always the same equilibrium, but if you are increasing the stimulus, you will get onto this equilibrium curve, but when you're decreasing, you're coming down on this equilibrium curve. So this is the, the classical hysteresis. And I will end the demo of V-cell events um, at this point. Okay, just uh, a quick comment. Um, there's also a couple of other tabs under protocols that uh, we didn't, obviously we won't have time to talk about, but you can do electrical events or assignment rules or other kinds of uh, um, sort of experimental manipulations of your model uh, as well as uh, the kinds of events that uh, you just heard about now. So I'm going to stop this recording and... I just, just one more comment from... This result was different than Kopazi's because Kopasi did not jump back. It stayed on the high branch, even when the signal was zero. They're different and, models. Ah, there's, okay, okay, different, okay. This one, mine was the positive, two, double positive feedback, and his oh. is a double negative. Okay, mm. got it, got it. I have a question. Okay. Uh, actually, Kopasi came, came back down on a different, uh, on a different uh, uh, equilibrium also. Uh, it, it, 
just Pedro didn't show it in the R versus S. He showed just he showed just the the time dependence. If you look at the equilibration on on Pedro's slide, it was on a different equilibrium. Okay, we really have to move uh, okay. forward if we're going to have time for the uh, the discussion session and not eat too much into the project session. So. Um, is that okay, Michael? I know you have a burning question. Is it really short? Uh, ju ju just in the future, someone has to talk about events at spatial models, because uh, that's what uh, that's what uh, Jan's going to talk about next, right? Yeah. Okay, right, right, and and um, actually, I was talking to Pedro about this, and we realized we're going to run late, but given that the background of the events. Uh, and the previous presentation by Mia and Jasraj uh, showed a lot of the Boolean use of uh, uh, the use of Boolean expression in in spatial simulation. There is really not that much to talk about in um, in the spatial discontinuity. So I should be done in about five minutes with this part. So should I leave the recording on? And just have one long thing that we can name appropriately. I'll just leave the the recording on then. Okay, go. Okay. So, um, let me start uh, screen share again. And I will bring in a different model. It has multiple different applications. And uh, this is an circadian clock oscillatory model that we've also been using at various demos and courses uh, based on the um, <coughs> well-known Bilal paper. And it has some um, spatial applications. And if we look at the spatial application under protocols, you will see that the events are actually grayed out. The reason for that is that in uh, the the actual spatial numerical solver um, cannot handle the arbitrary definition of events as an OD solver does. And that's uh, sort of a limitation of the PD numerical solver algorithm implementation. Um, and there's not much that we can do about it. However, but there's I also, when I interrupt, there's also a conceptual issue in, in that if you have a, a, a spatially, you, if you want to, change a species, for example, that has an uneven distribution in space, the only way you could potentially do it um, with an event is to create an instantaneous, you know, uniform reset of that species. And that probably isn't going to be all that useful. You could technically do it with an expression that will apply to every voxel in a 3D geometry, but this is something that's extremely difficult to implement and also difficult to control. But so. actually, for for things like photo bleaching, you can turn a laser on and off as a species using a time boolean. Correct. So that's this what is you're what talk I'm going about. with that. That's that's, that's, exact, that's exactly where I'm going about go, going to this. That, that you can actually have in the specifications of species, you can create quote unquote dummy species where 
the initial condition can be a function of time. So let's look back to the model that uh, we had this with the event here. So um, in an OD model, uh, okay, going to protocols, events, this event says that you have a number of different triggers that you can do either as a specific expression like arbitrary condition becomes true, which is what Pedro has shown, or single time, a variable change, a list of times, a linear time range. So in this case, it was a linear time range. 57 times it changed the value over 8,000 seconds. Now, if we look at the plot trigger part that I had shown where you can check yourself over whatever that amount of time was there to obtain the desired behavior, you also have a time function here which is a horribly long Boolean, but it is pre-calculated for you and you can copy that and use that in a spatial function, say, I want the value of R to be clamped function where it will have that horrible expression and it will become zero one zero one zero one. So this way you can create a in a spatial model a species that acts as the trigger that will be changing its value as a dependence of time by any function that you can use in an OD on a compartmental model. So really the only limitation is that you cannot use a function of say, a particular species going above a threshold. And the reason why you, you cannot do that is as Les pointed out, you know, in a spatial model, the a species concentration is often not uniform, so you it may be above the threshold in one area of the cell and below the threshold in the other area of the cell. In a well-mixed OD type model, you only have one value for a species concentration. In a spatial model, you have essentially an infinite value of concentrations. But time-dependent triggers you can implement them this way by creating time dependent functions. So any type of artificial stimulation of injecting things of uh, changing parameter values can be done by creating a species that is set to clamp and has its initial condition an arbitrary function of time that's a Boolean that can be zero or one. And then you multiply it with whatever you want. Um, and that's the same way in which you can localize the initial distribution of species or the different diffusion values of species in, um, in a spatial application, which has been shown yesterday by Mia and Jasraj. So I think that's all we need to talk about on uh, the spatial discontinuities. And of course, if anybody has questions, we can go in more details. I'm not sure if it just came across, but uh, you can define um, a spatial discontinuity, an actual, what you showed was a time change of a species, but you can actually define a spatial region for 
uh, the initial value of a species or the clamped value of a species as well. Right. That that's that's what what. Um, uh, what test, right? Yeah. What of, test, right? Uh, of me and Jasra. So so you can use in the in in the initial conditions clamp condition or in diffusion an expression that is a function of four uh, predefined uh, symbols, X, Y, Z, and T. So in fact, if you wanna see more about that, there's a, a very simple V-cell tutorial called uh, FRAP with binding that uh, explains both the uh, spatial, how you can have a spatial discontinuity in your in your initial conditions, mm -hmm. initial concentrations, and a time discontinuity. So, just wanted to point out that you have to clamp for the time discontinuity, I think, but you don't have to clamp for the spatial initial value. Right. Clamped means a force function of time, by definition. But you guys uh, had been talking about having clamped species, and that's true for time, but that's not true for initial conditions. They don't have to, have to be clamped in that case. I just want, don't, wanted to make sure that was clear to everybody. Okay, so any questions on this? Uh, if not, I'll stop and start the recording again so we have a clean break before we go to the issue of uh, command line interfaces and scripting and all that stuff. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and restart it. <laughs>